Siam has been a respected institution among classical musicians in the Philippines for its vision and objective in discovering and promoting budding artists as well as promoting classical music in the country through competitions and festivals. It has provided a stage for young musicians to be heard by a larger audience, hence has become a source of motivation for many aspiring artists. Also, Namsia has commissioned Filipino composers to provide contest pieces for the different categories that enable the composers to be heard and discovered by classical music enthusiasts in the country. Namsia has been a great stepping stone for young artists who then successfully pursue a career in music both in the Philippines and abroad. I wish Namsia continued success as it faces new challenges during and after this pandemic. I would like to congratulate and thank the officers and all the people behind this institution for their dedication and efforts in contributing to help build a strong foundation for the Filipino youth. Welcome to the 2020 National Music Competitions for Young Artists Web Seminars. Last year, 2019, in preparation for this year, we at NAMSHA always project a theme that shall banner our posters, trumpeting all our programs and projects. After much brainstorming, we adopted the Cebuano, Tingog sa Paglaong, Sounds of Hope. A theme may just be a theme, but Tingog, in its various usage, unknowingly for us then, acquired more meaning in this day of age, one might say these surreal times. Beyond sounds, melodies of hope are bountiful, intoning actively that we, as a people, shall overcome the challenges ahead with the multitude of voices that speak hope. Hope reverberates louder, if not at its loudest, this year. In this tenor, Namsha 2020 resolves that life goes on. Life goes cautiously on. Life goes on cautiously with music. It is with this gleeful realization that Namsha going online, despite numerous challenges, opened an opportunity, a wider reach. You are a virtual audience. Aside from our hourly competitions, we hope that this series of online web seminars would appease your anxiety as well as ours that our music world is in a standstill, paralyzed. With the assistance of our network of experts, music practitioners, educators, bearing Filipino sensibilities, we have assembled this series of online seminars that could enrich not just musicianship but reinforce our faith in the value of our art, especially in these trying times. Hoping that all of us sustain the best of health with an accompanying peace of mind two days ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Renato B. Lucas, NAMSHA President. Today, we would like to welcome all our participants from all over the Philippines. Salamat po sa inyong pagsali sa ating webinar for today. Welcome to the 2020 
Nam siya Tingog sa Paglaom Sounds of Hope webinar series. And today, we have a very interesting topic. It's about the Kundiman, Kumintang, Dansa Abanera, and other transcultural Filipino music genres. Now, I would like to introduce to you our speaker. She holds a Doctor of Philosophy in Music degree from the University of the Philippines College of Music. She is an Associate Professor of Musicology at the UST Conservatory of Music and presently the Director of the UST Research Center for Culture, Arts, and Humanities. She served as Research Fellow at the Departamento de Musicología, Facultad de Geografía y Historia, Universidad Complutense de Madrid in 2015 to 2016. Her research studies focus on various aspects of music that investigates cultural hybridity and music transculturation in 19th century colonial Philippines. Author of the book, Kirial de Baclayon, Año 1826, Hispanic Sacred Music in 19th Century Bohol, Philippines, by the Ateneo de Manila University Press in 2010, she played a key role in organizing the Musicological Society of the Philippines established in 2002. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Maria Alexandra Inigo Chua. Yes, good afternoon. I wish to thank NAMSIA, especially Dr. Renato Lucas President, Professor Ronan Ferrer, and the whole NAMSIA committee for the invitation to speak this afternoon. Tingog sa Paglaom, Sounds of Hope, is a fitting theme as Amsiya shares knowledge on aspects of Philippine music culture on this online virtual space that can reach a wider audience. Indeed, it is during this time of despair, uncertainties, and challenges that people need to express themselves in order to cope with the times. Music, just like any other art, becomes this avenue of human expression where hope is communicated through this diverse Philippine sounds. I am a historical musicologist that studies the music of our past. I will bring you to the sounds of the 19th century, a most dynamic period in Philippine history. What particularly transpired, transpired in Las Islas Filipinas in the 19th century? It was the end of the Galleon trade in 1815. It was the end of the early modern period, and it ushers in Philippine modernity. It was the beginning of modernity triggered by economic policy, opening the Philippines to free trade in 1834, and basically uh, the propagation of capitalism or economic capital in the country that made possible for families Filipino families to bring children, to bring their children to study abroad. It was also the beginning of lithographic printing, where it propelled printing of music as well as newspapers and the growth of our civil society. Commercial uh, steam travel as well um, commenced during this time. It was the opening of the Suez Canal that shortened travel time from the west to the east, or to Manila, connecting more the metropole to the colony. We also had the opening of the telegraph cable in the 19th century, and of course, the beginning of our national consciousness, the Philippine Revolution. This was the time of Gombursa, Rizal, Bonifacio, and many other Philippine heroes. As a musicologist, my interest in the period is a way to partake in some of the earliest evidence of notated or written music produced in the country by early Filipino composers. Investigating through the prism of music, I ask how music in the colony changed as it circulated during 19th century capitalism and modernity, focusing discussion on the transculturation of hybrid music genres such as the local kondiman, kumintang, and the borrowed danza abanera. What is presented here was called from my dissertation, Composing the Filipino, Music Transculturation and Hybridity in Urban Colonial Manila, 
where uh, I spent a year in Universidad Complutense in Madrid and Spain, going to different repositories to gather sources for this study through a scholarship grant granted by the Commission on Higher Education in the University of Santo Tomas. So let me begin. The title of my presentation is Condiman, Kumintang, Danza Habanera, and Other Transcultural Filipino Music Genre, where I will present as well, towards the end, perspectives in teaching Filipino music. Transculturation, what's transculturation? It is actually a paradigm, it is a, a theoretical framework of cultural contact which offers an ideal um, paradigm in the study of Filipino Hispanic music. It is a theory of cultural change that focuses on processes concerning cultural contact between two or more cultures. It suggests a degree of resistance from a community that bears the impact of a foreign culture this translates into an active creativity that reshapes both the local as well as the foreign culture, permitting the creation of new and original aesthetic values. As you would see, uh, the Philippines being a colony of Spain for almost 400 years, actually we will be celebrating 500 years already by next year in 2021, is that it was a great trigger in the cultural change of the Filipinos, wherein new forms actually evolve um, and new music genres were adapted as our own. So I tried to look into this. Um, now, why the 19th century? It is basically because it was during this time that we have some of the earliest evidence. Previous to this in the 18th century, very little has survived or practically nil has survived. I was able, um, some uh, uh, studies, scholars who have studied the early modern period in Manila from beginning from the 16th until the end of the 19th, uh, until the end of the 18th century, found only like one music source written for this. But after um, the period of uh, the, 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 the coming of music printing, the coming of lithography, the coming of peninsular com uh, music composers from, from the metropole, that you see this growth in Philippine music, wherein you now have material evidence, cultural objects of music that we can study. Therefore, I look into cultural hybridity and transculturation, which is the mixing of elements, which is characteristic in colonial encounters as cultural differences are bound to confront each other. Intercultural negotiations ensue and promotes two-way intercultural exchange. Actually, the transculturation is a, they say, a better paradigm than what uh, we have, the assimilation or the acculturation, wherein we only imbibe, but actually transculturation is that we actively participate. There is a local response and that we are actually the ones that make our culture based on what has been presented to us. So what, what am I looking into in this particular study? It investigates agents. Who are these agents? These are the composers, the music intellectuals, the music teachers, and their productions. What did they produce during this time? To examine what has ensued in this musical colonial engagement. It was in 19, 1997 that I, start, I started my journey in, try, in, in looking into the music of the Philippines. And the first one, my, my interest came into this uh, particular choir box of Bohol. And I am actually indebted to the people of Bohol for sharing this musical knowledge with me particularly Father Milan Ted Toralba, also scholars who have helped me in this research, such as Dr. William John Summers, uh, Regalado Trota Jose, and Father Manuel Maramba. On, when I did this particular study on the music of Bohol, when I was doing this study way back in 1997, I was a student. I was a master's student uh, taking up musicology at the UP College of Music. And when this was presented, oh, this is not Filipino music. So my, my question was that, how can this be Filipino? What is the process that made this music Filipino? When it is basically, if you look at it, it is the music 
that flourish in the churches in the West that was brought here to the Philippines. But one mass got my attention, and this is the Misa Baklayana that you see in your screen right now. As what you would see, it came from that particular town in, in Bohol, which is Baklayon. And looking into this study, I've seen that it was really the people who even made these choir books made from parchment. Uh, actually, this was made from cowhide. So this is 126 pages of cowhide. There, you would need like one cow to produce four volumes, uh, four pages of music. So can you can just imagine how many cows <laughs> were were slot just to produce this cantoral? But because it is cowhide, it it actually. Uh, came down to us, it was not written on paper. So until now, this is actually displayed at the Church of Baclayon. And with this, Buhol now actually actively sings this music from their music heritage. Just to give you, this is dated 1824. It's quite, it's one of the earliest um, music sources that we have of this uh, transcultural Filipino um, music that actually existed here in the in 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 the Philippines in the colony during that that time just to give you an example we we did a recording and this recording was actually um, granted uh, a grant by the program for cultural cooperation by the Instituto Cervantes so I just want to bring you to that particular sound of the church during the time where people, no, the, the, the introduction of Christianity, the, the, the coming of Christianity to Paul. As you know, Buhol now is one of the uh, earliest that, has, uh, uh, that was Christianized during that time. And, and they take pride in, in the music that ha has been preserved in, in the islands. This is Misa de Sales. It is a polyphonic, it is one of the complex masses uh, out of the 26 masses that was in the Kirial de Baclayon. The Misa de Sales presents uh, three voices wherein you have the, the coro, the choir, or the cantus, or the tiples, or the girl sopranos, uh, uh, a boy soprano and the soprano singing in alternation with the boys, uh, with the tenors and the basses. So it's just a wonderful um, experience to be able to recreate this music when I did this research way back in 1997. So, can we play the... This is Años Dei from Misa de Sales. So what you just heard is the Años Dei from Misa de Sales, a polyphonic mass from the Kirial de Esta Iglesia de Baclayon, which was performed by the UST singers with Fidel Calalang no, as conductor and Father Manuel, the late Father Manuel Maramba, playing in the, performing in the, in the organ. So I bring you to that. So this is 1824, just um, right after the end of the, uh, of the Galleon trade, which ended in 1815. Then I bring you to another period in the 19th century of Philippine modernity when, when the, the colony actually opened to free trade in 1834. This uh, uh, economic policy you know, uh, brought so much changes in, in, in the culture 
of the archipelago. But I want you to point. Uh, I want to point you out to these two specific musical notation from the early modern period. As I've told you, very, very little has survived from the music of the of the uh, early modern period, um, previous to the 1834. But these two actually, um, we were able to to uh, take hold of this. One is Letra en Tagalo. This is a villancico for the Corpus Christi, which was actually retrieved by Dr. William Summers from San Juan del Monte Church in, in San Juan. So it's a, it's a church. What's quite interesting here is that there is no date, but according to Dr. William Summers, who's a scholar in this particular study of music, is that it is dated possibly and probably in the 18th century. So if ever this is the only music, there are actually four villancicos, but this is the one that is in the vernacular, which is in, in Tagalog. This has been um, recorded as well and, and arranged, uh, which was done by um, David Irving, another historian who studied uh, the music of early modern Manila and also reproduced in Saisai Himig, uh, which is a UP College of Music publication under the editorship of Dr. Arwin Tan. But the second one, which is La Pampangita, as you see, it's a baile, no? baile canción. It's La Pampangita. I found this in, in, in Spain, and quite interesting is that it is dated 1832, and it is the earliest notated music that we have. This 1832 transcription of this music, a baile canción de Filipinas, was part of a, the collection titled Nueva Colección de Canciones Españolo, uh, Españolas y Americanas con Acompañato de Piano, Forte y Guitarra which was um, actually uh, trying to collect you know, indigenous sounds, indigenous music from the different colonies, from the Americas as well as from the Philippines. The collection you know, clearly displayed interest in the folk and the exotic, which was a trend then of the 19th century romanticism, that interest in what is the folk, you know, what is the indigenous, um, and, and being presented as well in, in the music. We haven't had uh, a recording of La Pampangita yet, but uh, w while I was playing it in the piano, you see that it could have been an older tradition because of the presence of the drone you know, with, the, with the melody on, on top. Now we go to that particular period in Philippine history, which is Philippine modernity in the 19th century. After 1834, what happened in the colony? As what I've said, it is the most dynamic as Manila enters the age of modernity, cosmopolitanism, and an, an emerging sense of national consciousness. The rise of global trends such as the advent of modern uh, technological innovations like steam-powered intercontinental shipping and lithographic printing, the rise of capitalist international market, and the conscious awareness of liberal ideas from Europe and other colonies you know, were major factors in the changing uh, or in the transformation of the culture of the islands. The colonial city, which is Manila, experienced economic growth as a result of this growing international trading enterprise, where an active musical life flourished, music stores and uh, music publishing establishments opened in the capital city. French and Italian opera companies, you know, regular performances in the theaters as early as 1848, you know, 1865, these were the, the, the big um, presentations or performances, productions of uh, Italian operas and French operas in the Philippines. Now, evil with presentations of Sarsuela companies were a regular in the city soundscape. Spanish composers and musicians from the peninsula immigrated to this distant colony to establish an active musical career. Thus, the natives' regular consumption of European music and eventual performances of this repertoire in theaters, salons, and concerts by the many regimental bands were prodigious factors in the changing cultural taste of the people. 
as I've told you, lithographic printing came to the Philippines in 1858. So this was actually established by the brothers, the Opel brothers. So they established the Manila Lithographia de Opel in, in 1858. And one of the very first that music that they printed is actually a collection of music. And this is the Manuel Cantoral para el uso de las religiosas de Santa Clara de Manila that you see in your screen right now. As you would see, this is dated 1871 to 1874. This is very crucial because this is one of the first printed music. And it actually preserves the music of Intramuros Manila. As what you see that Intramuros was put into ground zero and very little has survived. This square book actually survived in the different repositories around the Philippines. So volume two, I was able to retrieve in Bohol, volume one in Manila, and volume three in Archdiocese of San Fernando in Pampanga, and volume four was in, in San Francisco del Monte in Quezon City. So I was able to retrieve this. And when I was in Spain, in, in the Francisco Iberico uh, archives, I found all the four volumes of this particular choir book. So we have, we have the music of this era. And quite interesting is that this is not only the music of the 19th century, because it tried to collect all the music that was being sung in the church or in the Monasterio de uh, de Santa Clara, no? the uh, um, St. Clair monastery, uh, monastery, which was in Intramuros. So it was a collection of music. And as you would see here, the Misa Hispano Filipina, it could not have been produced anywhere. It was not just a copy, or it was not just a notation of music from, from, from the West, but it is music that was really composed here in, in Manila. So it's very interesting. Uh, I did some articles on this particular music, but we still need to actually publish and, and present this in, in, in uh, possibly a recording you know, so that we will hear all this music that was present in Manila, particularly in Intramuros during that, that time. So I now go to another aspect of research. Actually, um, do we have Alisa? Anyway, I'll now go to another aspect of research, and, and this is secular music. As what you've seen, previews to um, Philippine modernity, most of the music that actually, um, that actually survive are sacred music. But when you go into the 1850s, 1860s, because of the opening of Manila to free trade, the coming of the French, the Italians, uh, uh, the Germans as well to come up with business, or British to do business here in the colony, is that you see that the secular music started to evolve and to develop in terms of writing, in terms of notating secular music. Now, I now go to this particular, I think the condiman, the condiman is the quintessential Filipino form. If, if you would look, if you would ask someone, uh, uh, what is a Filipino song? Oh, it's the condiman. But do we really know where, how our condiman evolved? Where is it from? When I was a student um, taking further studies um, in my music, I, a professor told me, actually, a professor told me to research one of the topics that I did was the condiman. And when I looked into these sources, very little, actually, I've seen very little on how it really started. They say that it is a folk song. You have the condiman in 1800. No, it's folk song, therefore, it did not survive. But it has been uh, transcribed in the, eight, uh, in the 1940s, 1950s by uh, Professor Antonio. Molina. But are there earlier? We, we know the condiman as the condiman, for example, composed by Bonifacio Abdon, by Nicanor Abelardo, by Francisco Santiago. But there, are there any earlier condimans? Uh, and this is what I will be presenting to you. Some of the early um, sources that I found in the 19th century that would actually give us, that would gov actually give us how more or less no, the process on how this particular music genre has evolved. So I give you 
I, I present to you this one of the earliest uh, representation of the condiman, and it is a painting by Jose Honorato Lozano from the album uh, Vistas de las Islas Filipinas. It trajes y sus habitantes, which was published in 1847. And you see here an El Condiman that is being danced. It's the Condiman. What is the Condiman? What is the Comentang? We know them as songs. But is it really dance? Is, it, is the Condiman a dance? Then we look into the source. Actually, if you look into the internet, readily it will give you this particular picture of the Condiman. But not many knows uh, not many knows that there is actually a description of this condiman in that particular publication by Jose Honorato Lozano. And what is this? And I want, I, I presented this here, I want to read it to you as one of the earliest account of the condiman. It's not only a written account, but he also wrote and notated the condiman and the comintang. So I just want to read you this. Um, the Indians, according to okay, according to Honorato um, Lozano, the Indians are not very fond of dancing. If by one means to move with some speed, they dance and sing the condiman and the comintang. But although some use in certain steps the castanets and take some animation, it is undoubtedly a modern introduction because the dancers themselves are a kind of pantomime between the one who sings and dances, expressing this with their actions, the words that one pronounces, but with much lethargy, with such languor that, is, that seems that they are about to die or that they are hungry for a great feeling. There are some dancers and professional dancers who go to the houses when there is some function and sometimes the bolero, you know, fandango, and other Spanish dances such as the waltz and even the mazurka are danced. The mestizos and some Indians dance also contra danzas. Contra danzas are actually danza habaneras and valses which are wads and what is admirable is that seldom do they drop their chapines or slippers embroidered on silver of silver and gold that they use although they do not have straps but supports it with the tips of the toes it was a very clear and vivid observation of Lozano that he actually presented and represented in this particular publication. And it clearly says that the condiman and, and the comintang are sang dances. And that the condiman, it's not very rigid. It's not rhythmic. It's sort of like a very lethargic uh, dance. It's sort of like a walk expressed like pantomime. So that is the very clear uh, um, description of Jose Lozano in the Condiman as well as the Comintang. Now, the Lozano uh, account also presents the earliest, oh, I, not the earliest, actually in 1846, there is a Comintang that came out. This is very well um, publicized. There is um, a Comintang that came out in the publication of um, Mala, John Mala, in his book, Les Philippines, His History, Geography, Mayor, Agriculture, Industry, El Commerce, the Colonies Españoles, Dance La Oceana in 1846. And this is the Comintang de la Conquista. So uh, this is, I think, where you say that our Comintang is a war song in a way, but eventually it will evolve into um, a love song you know, as well. So let's listen to this. It's an 1846, and this came from uh, the Sai Sai Himig, the Sai Sai Himig uh, anthology, which was produced uh, from the UP College of Music during the time that when we were, I was studying as well this transcultural music, and I, I contributed uh, a number of articles in that in that particular book. So let's listen to give you uh, just an idea of how music, how music actually um, sounded, no, or the comintang that we know as a war song sounded, and this is performed by Nathan. Neil, no, Manintim, and Mike Corosa in the guitar and Mike Corosa 
uh, baritone in the voice. Let's listen. Sa sanday tigan, ang may dusa nito ng aking kahirapan. Di mo na nilingon, pinalungay lungay, pagsinta sa iyong walang kaliluhan. Di mo na nilingon, pinalungay. Pagsinta sa iyong walang kaliluhan Signos at planetas Okay, so we hear uh, one of the earliest uh, notation of music in the Philippines that came out in a particular book that has been uh, recreated and, and, and performed the present age, we see that there is indeed this indigenous uh, aspect of this particular melody. Uh, but when you look into the, if you see it in the screen, when you look into the Comentang by Honorato Lozano, and an analysis of the melody of the Comentang uh, by Honorato as well as the Comentang, is that they have uh, relatively the same or relatively related, related melody. But what is quite different is the accompaniment. In the Kumitang, we see a what's accompaniment that, that was uh, put in, into the Honorato Lozano. So you see this clear hybridity in it, wherein an accompaniment of the West is being put into these melodies of the of the uh, indigenous melodies of the of the colony. Unfortunately, we still don't have a recording of the Comintang by Honorato Lozano. So I now go to another uh, transcription of Jose Lozano. I, I, I really don't know if Jose Honorato Lozano was a musician and that he was able to transcribe this to the Comintang and the Condiman in an 1847 book. Um, uh, book no in, in his 1847 book but quite interesting is that we have now two condimans here he had a condiman viejo which is for him an old condiman and a condiman nuevo which is a new condiman so and and he even wrote he even wrote the lyrics of this particular condiman so we have an 1847 condiman uh, and what's quite interesting is that this condiman is sung in both Spanish as well as Tagalog. So if I would present to you, this is the, the, the text no? uh, in Spanish. And when you transcribe uh, or when you uh, translate it, it is, Look then what you have caused. A thousand evils I suffer from sorrow. I die captive. You have me imprisoned. What sense and power, O woman, what have you done? And he goes into the estribillo, which is the chorus. Ay kondiman, ay kandungan, pusong nalulunod sa gipin mo at sayang, sa gipin mo neneng, kahina, hinayang. So it was in Tagalog, but the original, uh, you have a Spanish and then you have a Tagalog. And you, ha you see this you know, hybridity wherein you have melodies being transcribed now into Western harmonies. So... Um, Let's again hear, uh, let's hear this particular condiman. This is the condiman um, nuevo, uh, the condiman viejo, the old condiman, now sung by um, Mike Corosa with Michelle Nicolasora in the piano, um, under uh, which was uh, taken from the Saisai Himig, an anthology of transcultural Filipino music. Mira por tu causa. Mil males 
padezco, padezco de penas, de penas me muero. Cautivo me tienes, preso el pensamiento, sentido y potencia, ay dueña que has hecho, ay cundiman, ay cundangan, pus una lulunod, sagipin mutsayang, sagipin monenen, Kahina hinayang Determina nening Lo que debe hacer Que si soy de vida Explícame pues Que si soy de muerte No hay más que sufrir Espero el momento En que ha de morir Ay cundiman Ay kundangan Pusong nalulunod Sagipin mo't sayang Sagipin mo neneng Kahinahinayang Okay, the pathos, of, uh, the pathos of love brings sorrow when unrequited A common theme even in later composed condiments. The, uh, the expression of love is demonstrated through the text and music that both utilize the language of the colonizer and the colonized. The bilingual utilization creates a type of hybridity in which characteristic features of both the ruler and the ruled are recognized. The lament is dance with less energetic movements, thus exhibiting emphasis in melodic gestures done in rhythmic action. But quite interesting is that you have a, a, a local melody, an indigenous melody, in that is provided with a very Western accompaniment, which is a waltz accompaniment at that. And the form in itself, which is an estribillo and a copla, is actually a form of the another transcultural genre, which is the villancico. The villancico is one of the very first you know, music genre that came actually to the Philippines uh, as part of our um, church music tradition. Okay, now I go now to the next. This is 1847. In 1847 as well, we see the very first theater produced, uh, produced established or constructed in, in Manila. I think it was 18... 46 or 1847, that we see theaters. And this is a picture of the Binondo Theater. I think it was newly built during that time. When Honorato Lozano, it was newly built in Manila, when Honorato Lozano uh, uh, drew, no? this, uh, uh, drew this uh, picture of the, not really a picture, but uh, a painting of the uh, Teatro de Benondo. Now, why is 1847 very important? With the establishment of theaters, you see now sarsuelas, operas, as well as other theater productions such as sainetes being uh, performed in the city. And with the opening uh, of the Suez Canal, where in uh, even previous to that, no, there were already Italian opera companies. And this has been a study of Dr. Uh, William Summers, uh, 40 Nights in the Opera, that has been published in, in a journal. If you want, um, you can actually check this out. The theater in, in Manila started around the 1840s, 1847. But my interest is, is that, are there surviving music that were sung in the theater? Because it's very important when you look into just a written account, but you cannot hear or you cannot see what was the music during that time. When I was in Spain, I was fortunate to have been uh, to have access in the, with this particular uh, newspaper, the La Oceania Española, which started already around 1870, 1871. So I spent actually my months there in the library copying because you cannot photocopy because these are very large papers. You cannot take photos. Actually, I took photos. So this is one photo with their permission. With their permission. So they allowed me to take 10 photos of this. But I would spend practically the whole day not even uh, not naman the whole day because libraries in Spain would close at around two o'clock. After two o'clock, I would leave. But I would write down all the accounts 
of musical theater in Manila and even uh, concerts in Luneta and Malikon hand uh, uh, typewritten with my computer in it. And quite interesting is that I found accounts of the sarsuelas as well as the operas being performed during that time. Now I want, uh, uh, and which I will present to you in a while, but I want to uh, put our focus now in, in one particular composer, and this is Ignacio Masaguer Campeni. Ignacio Masaguer is a young musician who is from the uh, uh, peninsula. He was a Catalan. He was possibly uh, Ig uh, Igualada, where he was uh, where he was born, is part of Barcelona, is part of uh, the, Cat uh, uh, the Catalonia region. So he came here to the Philippines at a very young age, at around 20. No, he was born in 1846. By 18, around 1866, 1867, 68, he was already here in the Philippines. He lived in the Philippines. He would go back because I even found an account of him going back to Spain. Then travel. So he would travel. He would travel. Um, uh, he would travel across the metropole to, to to the colony. But he did come up and put up a business here in Manila. He put up a, a, a music store, which is the um, uh, Masaguer Echegoyen with another Catalan. Um, we don't know if Echegoyen is an insulares or a pen peninsulares. So actually, Masaguer is a peninsulares who came to the Philippines, lived here, and fell in love with a Filipina. And married here, bore, uh, uh, bore children here, and died in Manila. Now, why is uh, Masaguer important. Actually, this is I found this particular uh, with uh, music in in Biblioteca Nacional, the La Bella Filipina. Uh, this is available in the internet, so I, I did not uh, put in the the music, but uh, you can search La Bella Filipina is available in the internet. As what you would see is that this is the lithographic cover of the music sheet that was published during that time. Why is it important as of now? In the present um, day, this is the earliest extant secular music that we have. So this is around 18, possibly 1870s, 1871, 72, 73, which was done and printed in Manila. It was not printed in Spain, but it was printed in Manila, as uh, you can see here, by Letografia de Opel. The lithographic printer, the German uh, brothers who established a printing press in Manila. And the brothers actually lived as well in Manila and died in Manila. So this is one of the uh, rare no, extant music that we have. It's a printed music. And quite interesting, what is La Bella Filipina? It is a danza. And what's a danza? It's a danza, a banera. Um, so you see... Uh, you see that the danza, what, what is a danza? What is a danza habanera? No, so if uh, I, I may, no, a danza habanera is a musical genre that originated from Cuba. As what you see, habanera, meaning Havana. So it's a dance from Havana, Cuba. Um, and because, again, th this is an outgrowth of uh, colonialism, no? Cuba being a colony of Spain during that time, no? It, it actually grew or flourished in the first half of the 19th century. So the danza habanera in itself is a non 19th century phenomenon. Uh, as what they say, its beginnings can be traced to the French contradanza in the 18th century that has its origins in turn from the English country dance. In Havana, Cuba, African cross rhythms no, merge with the European danza producing a creolized expressions that was partly termed contradanza habanera and eventually or a contradance from Havana then later became danza habanera and eventually in some Latin American colonies it became referred to just as danza or just as habanera. So habanera became known to be a slow dance in two four time with an accented second beat. Now, why, is, why, why am I very interested with Ignacio Masaguer? Is that when I was in Spain, I was just, it was a Eureka moment for me when I found this particular habanera from a zarzuela. And the zarzuela was from Viaje Redondo. And uh, Viaje Redondo, based on my research, is actually the very first zarzuela that was composed 
in the islands. Now, this is quite interesting because in most of our books, in most of our history books, they say that uh, the Sarsuela tradition actually came to the Philippines in 1879. So it was already uh, a late tradition and that Spanish Sarsuelas were being actually performed here, Spanish Sarsuelas. That's true. In the La Ushania Española, you see all performances of many Spanish Sarsuelas. But one is quite important because this one has been publicized in, in the newspapers to be the very first sarsuela composed in the Philippines. So it was well publicized and it was even, if, if you look at the Aparato Bibliográfico of uh, Retana, it was listed there that it was, uh, it was performed in Teatro Circulo no, in 1878. And I even found accounts of um, the printing of the libretto in La Ushania Española of this particular Viaje Redondo. Now, the problem is that I have not, I have not retrieved the libretto. But when I did some research, I found that there is an, uh, a Viaje Redondo in, in Australia. I don't know if that is really the libretto, then we have to retrieve that libretto from um, an Austral uh, Australian archives. But quite interesting is that we have this. We have the habanera. Th and that we can see what really was the music then that was played in Viaje Redondo. Viaje Redondo was well performed. It was well performed beginning from 1878 as, er uh, as late as 1881, 1882. In the newspaper, you see performances of Viaje Redondo. Now, why is this important? It's important because uh, the New South Wales plot actually is a love story between Miguel no, and Consuelo, they fell in love. Miguel came to, to the colony and the two fell in love. So possibly uh, Sir, uh, Consuelo could have been as mestiza, a Filipina no, during that, that time. So let's listen to Viaje Redondo. I was able to uh, have um, Jasmine Salvo. Uh, Jasmine Salvo with uh, Ding Dong Fiel no, perform this habanera from Viaje Redondo. This is the very first time that I will be uh, presenting this music to any of the conferences. So let's listen to Habanera. interesting I think I got it wrong it was Consuelo who was who traveled from the peninsula to Manila and fell in love with Miguel who was a Filipino possibly an insulares or a mestizo but the father the father didn't want 
no Miguel for Consuelo because he wanted Consuelo to be married to a Peninsulares. So, um, so may mga comic relief, no? And 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 there is this a uh, disguise of a young man in mestizo who was playing jokes on the father, who where, who came from the peninsula to. Uh, so why why is this? So this particular story becomes very. Um, relevant and meaningful to the Filipino experience. So it's possible that's why um, the, the sarsuela was being presented years, no, even after it, was, it has been shown. Now, quite interesting is that while I was studying, I never ever came across the sarsuela Viaje Redondo. So I tried to look into why, why, why is it not written in our history books? And I even check um, if you would know uh, Raimundo Banyas, no Filipino music and theater should have actually uh, uh, written, should actually have written an account of the Viaje Redondo, but it is not. What was written are just plays written by Regino Escalera and Frederico Casademont, who also wrote the libri libretto for Viaje Redondo. They have plays that was um, actually mentioned by why why not the viaje redondo so that was a big puzzle uh, a big puzzle uh, to me and it is possibly because of this that the banyas miss viaje redondo that it did not actually survive you no know, uh, in our written accounts because as you see um, banyas was written in the 1920s you no know, and it has become the the common um, source of music of the Hispanic period, so it's a very quite it's very interesting this this um, rediscovery of this particular habanera from Viaje Redondo. Now we go now to the next. There now is this the first danza? Of course not. The La Bella Filipina was also a danza, as you would see here in your screen. These are the danza danza habanera that was published in 19th century, such as the Goyita. Now, by Ramo, uh, Remigio Calahora. Remigio Calahora was a, a secular, not a priest, who came to the Philippines and became the director of the Colegio Niños de Tiples in the 1850s, 1860s. So he was one of the secular mus musicians who came here, lived here for seven years together with his brother, Apolinar Calahora, who was a violinist, who took over his post because uh, Remigio Calahora was... Um, he was the uh, 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 choral director of the uh, Royal Chapel in Madrid. So it, it was that uh, big, he was a big, he was a big personality in music who came to Manila and became the director of the Coleos, the Niños Tiples. And, he, and what survived, uh, Remigio Calahora, I studied Remigio Calahora because of his villancicos. Because during that time in the 1850s, in the 1860s, villancicos were a big thing. No, uh, a big thing during that time. And we've, I've actually found a villancico composed by Remigio Calahora, possibly in the Philippines, in um, the archives of um, UST, in the UST archives. But that would be another topic, no? the villancicos by Calahora. But I was so surprised that even Remigio Calahora, who was a peninsularis, who lived here in Manila for seven years, would actually have a danza banera. He was mainly, he was... He was actually publishing music, mostly sacred music, and this is one of the rare times that he published a danza habanera, and it could have been an influence then here in the islands when he was living here, and that he um, he that made him compose this danza habanera goyita. Yes, no recording still exists, so we still have to. And another one is the Porque Llorabas. Again, as you see, it's an habanera by Diego Perez. Another very interesting. Um, uh, personality in music is Diego Perez. He was the teacher. He was a, a prolific teacher, and he composed. No, and he was uh, the one. Uh, he was also uh, he engaged in music publishing, and this is one of his published work. Later on, you will see another of his published work, which is the Recuerdos de Filipinas. Nobody knows really who Diego Perez was if he was uh, an insulares, a peninsulares, a mestizo, we really don't know. At least with, Mas at least with Masager, we know that he was a peninsulares who came here in, in the colony at a very young age and lived here and actually actively participated. He taught music, he put up um, a music business, he composed sarsuelas. No? But with Diego Perez, very little is known of who Diego Perez 
was. He was teaching in, in Ateneo, and he was the teacher of Dolores Paterno, who was the sister of Pedro Paterno. Later on, uh, Dolores Paterno would also be a very important personality in music. And then we have Julio Nakpil. Now, later I will be discussing quite extensively Julio Nakpil. Uh, Julio Nakpil's Recuerdos de Capis is a uh, um, habanera characteristica para piano. So you see now that the danza being translated, which is basically a uh, a song no? and, and dance genre being translated now in, in, in the instruments such as the Recuerdos de Capis by Julio Nakpil. Julio Nakpil is one of the early indigenous, oh, no, no, local, native, wag naman native, it's local daw, an indigen who is not at all, does not have any um, Spanish blood that uh, actually engage no? in, in, in music. Now, I've, I've talked about Dolores Paterno in connection with Diego Perez. Uh, she was a student of Diego Perez. Now, I, I want you to listen to this. This is now uh, a danza, a danza habanera, titled La Sampanguita, La Sampaguita, or another uh, title is La Flor de Manila. Actually, in some accounts, it's called La Flor de Manila, the flower of Manila. But in this printed account, it's called uh, La Sampaguita. Now, if you look at this print, this cover print, it was printed in Madrid in 1887. It's quite interesting, the history of this particular, particular piece. You see, um, it was dedicated um, to Isabel de Borbon, no? uh, Musica Civilization Filipina. Then you have La Sampaguita. And you ha see there, El Maginoo Paterno. This was published by Pedro Paterno. He was an illustrado who, was, who, who went to Spain and stayed there no, for, for a long time. And why 1887? 1887 was the year wherein the Exposition uh, de Filipinas will be held, was held in Madrid. So they were preparing for something. They were preparing for music, everything, no? literature, poetry, anything related to the colony would actually be presented in, in, in Madrid. So it was, uh, the, even world expositions during that time was a phenomenon of the 19th century. If you remember, Claude Debussy heard the gamelan in an exposition in Paris. And from there, it changed no, his music. He was, uh, he was actually, because with the absence of recording, absence of anything, you, you only hear this music through these exchanges. No? So that was a big thing then. So there was this initiative for the colony to present something. And in 1887, when I was in, in, in Madrid and, and looking for this, um, and also in the Biblioteca de Catalunya, I found so many uh, uh, so many, quite a number of, of music sheets printed for that particular occasion. You have uh, an Almar Almagro transcription of Alulay and Abalitao. Then you have this um, La Sampaguita, which is an original composition of a Filipina. Now, Dolores Paterno passed away already in 18, uh, 1881, I think. She passed away very young. So this publication actually came after already 1887. So possibly Pedro Paterno as a tribute to his, um, uh, uh, to his um, sister who was a musician presented this. So this is the only uh, known music composed by Dol Dolores Paterno. Now, why am I presenting this? Because you see very um, uh, great similarities to the danza by Masager. You know? But of course, aside from the similarity, there are also some differences into it. So let's listen to this. And, and if, if you're the music of the Masager Abanera is still uh, with you, so you, you try to compare this music of La Sampaguita. So can we have?
Okay, so if you would look at it and you will try to compare how is a Peninsularis habanera differs with a habanera that was composed no? and, and written by a Filipina. If you would look at it, uh, even the beginning with the octaves introduction, no? even the harmonic um, a progression would basically be the same, but you see that there is more emphasis given to the melody. The, the rubato, no? it becomes a little slower than, than, than the delays and then the turns, no? but you, you just don't see that much in, in the Habanera. If uh, looking into the music, for example, of Diego Perez, wala yung ganyong ano, no? So that particular importance given to, to the melody becomes a defining factor actually in the transculturation of music. Now, possibly, why is this? Um, possible it is possible maybe because the, the the sensibility the filipino sensibility to music has this fatos sentimentality importance in the music that you see in the condiman no the, the previous to it so you see this hybridity coming in the danza habanera which is very foreign no coming to the philippines but we put in no the filipino sensibility into it and that la sampagita it's readily available. It has been performed by many in the guitar, and it has a song version um, already. You have the Spanish, you have the Tagalog version that you can easily um, look into. The but I wanted to present to you the piano because there is this piano transcription, or uh, possibly the who composed transcription that was published in 1887 during the Exposition Reunal done by Pedro Paterno. Now, together with that Sampagita are three transcriptions of local genres. Then you have here the uh, Kumintang, the Kondiman, and the Balitao. So these three were chosen by Pedro Paterno. Who did the transcription? We don't know. It was only his name who's in there, but I doubt if Pedro Paterno did the transcription himself. And this could have been uh, circulated, these melodies were circulating. And what's quite interesting is that, as I've told you, in, in terms of hybridity, because the melodies are the one in existence, when they, you try to write it on, on, on notation, uh, notation music, you have to put in, and then it would, because um, piano was a 19th century instrument as well that came to Manila, you have to put in a harmonic accompaniment. So the harmonic accompaniment becomes very Western with that local melody on top. So these are the three, as well as the lulay and the balitao. Now, if you would look at it, these works were actually presented in an international you know, exposition, in a world exposition during that time. So this becomes now transnational, being representations of music from the Philippines. Um, if, if you play this, medyo contracted ang, I know, because in trying to put in together that melody with, with uh, that local melody with a uh, uh, Western harmonic accompaniment, medyo contrived, hindi ganun ka, kaganda ang pagka-arrange. No? And if you would look at it, are the kondiman, are the kumintang uh, being presented in local, uh, for example, uh, compositions? I have here two, two compositions by Diego Perez, the Recuerdos de Filipinas, and Jose Estella. Jose Estella is an insularis. He was born here, lived here, and considered a Filipino composer, but he was an insularis. He was purely Spanish. No? Um, so he wrote La Tagala, and this is uh, Tanda de Valses. Tanda de Valses are suit of valses. Quite interesting is that La Tagala, the, the suite in itself, is named after local genres. So you would start with Kumintang, you will have the Kondiman, no? So, but why valses? Because the, the, tr the harmonic accompaniment that was used was basically, because it's in three, four time, waltzes, no? So possibly that. So you see already that during that time, we, we don't have any composition of a Filipino composer composing condiman, but mostly transcriptions and used in, in particular, uh, particular compositions in a bigger work wherein they try to just um, come up with the motives of it. 
So, this was again uh, uh, printed. Now, uh, I want you to look into the, what are the accounts of the performances? Are this being performed? Are this being performed in, in Manila? And how is it performed? Because you see the music, you, you've seen one, and that is the Honorato Lozano, 1847. I went through all the newspapers, not, not all, some of the newspapers that I can, and, and found some of this, um, so, some of this uh, accounts of performances of these dances in, in, in Manila. So accounts of the performances of transcultural genre, and if I may read, you know, they dance minuets, contra danzas, which is habanera, and all the dances of the world, the sacatito, which is a kind of fandango, the condiman, in which two women sing and dance alternately in a pleasant and very harmonious tone. And this is from um, Joaquin Martinez de Suniga. In an 1881 account by uh, Lorenzo de Ayot, uh, which was published in a newspaper in El Globo, there was a play, there was a musical play uh, entitled Bernardo Carpio, no, being performed in the Tagalog Theater. Ang sabi dito, where the condiman was performed. And if I may quote, uh, these are all in Spanish, so this is already my English translation. Finally comes the end of the drama, Cuello de Cisne, or the neck of the swan. No? Uh, Cuello de Cisne dies like a Cleopatra. A terrible scuffle returns. Bernardo dances the condiman. So it is very clear that the condiman is being performed in the context of the uh, Filipino or the Tagalog theater. No? So the dances, just as what we've seen in the in Viaje Redondo, no, the condiman was being performed in Tagalog theater. Another one, the condiman through Spanish songs in which their greatest glory is to imitate the European in dress, pomp, and customs, have abandoned the old dances of Kumintang and Talindao for the waltzes, polkas, and habaneras, as well as the song of the condiman with Spanish songs that spoil with much grace. So there was an account in 1877 that the Filipino, or the, the, the people of the colony, were dancing waltzes, polkas, and they were trying to abandon their local genres such as the Comintang, the Talindao, and the Condiman. Therefore, um, Condiman and Comintang, as I would say, are slow sung dances. They compare them to pantomime, which enacts true movements, the words of the song set to regular verses. They are dances characterized by much lethargy, languor, and much sentimentality, and that it, ev uh, it seems that they are about to die. The text of the Kondiman, sung in mixed Spanish and Tagalog, reflects the languid emotionality as the man falls captive to the love of a woman. He pleads for her answer to save him from this abysmal love. So, um, it, we never thought of the Kondiman. Uh, we always sing the Komintang is a war song. No, it's a song dance which eventually became you know, a love song. And, and the most common Komintang that we know today is, of course, Mutianam Pasig by Nicanor Abelardo, which is now technically a love song. But these are dances. The Kondiman, as we would say, it's a love song in three fourth time. But as you would see, it's not. Three for time, it is a very slow dance um, uh, wherein it enacts the, the verses no, of the song. Now, I want to go to this another point of research. If you would look at the period of the 19th century, you have the early modern period wherein uh, mostly sacred music were sung, then you then it ushered in the period of modernity, no, 1834, 1850s, 60s the 70s, and then we go now to the 80s. By 1872, the Gombursa was executed. And by 1880s, you see Filipino illustrados, no? uh, Filipino illustrados going to Spain, studying in Spain, and you see that this is the beginning of the birth of national consciousness. And you see another period now in the history of, of in Philippine history, but of course, in the music as well. So. Can, it, this, can this be reflected in our music? By 1888, we have a native, a local composer who was already composing dances. And 
this is Julio Nakpil. Julio Nakpil is a very interesting, uh, this is actually my current study now. Uh, it's been almost more than two years that I've been studying the music of Julio Nakpil through a grant given by the Commission on Higher Education, uh, and the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, the University of Santo Tomas Research Cult uh, Center for Culture, uh, for Research Center for Culture, Arts, and Humanities, as, uh, as well as with partnership with Bahay Nakpil. What are we doing? We are trying to gather all the music of this particular um, local Filipino composer of the 19th century to present it into a critical uh, music edition. We have already um, gathered around 40 plus of his music that will be presented in a two volume music edition. And we have recorded already most of, almost all of his works which will be produced in a four volume recording album. So very interesting because as you see, almost all his works are basically the genres that was presented to him in the 19th century. His very first work was a sephiro, which was a polka. But quite interesting here is that even if it's a polka or he, he was composing habanera, he was composing mazurka, no, he was composing gavot, is that there is this element of um, maturity in his music that it was not merely the waltz the, the, the waltz accompaniment with a melody, but you hear some um, imitations already and then the form. So I want you to listen to uh, the very first habanera that Julio Nakpil composed for the piano. Okay, so let's have La Brisa Nocturna, the evening breeze. Okay, so you hear the very first habanera composed. There would be many other. He wrote actually a total of nine habaneras, such as the pinching, habanera para piano. He wrote a vocal piece, habanera, entitled Pag Ibig, uh, for actually his wife, no? Gregoria uh, de Jesus, who was the widow. He married actually uh, the widow of Andres Bonifacio and possibly dedicated that, that danza habanera to his wife. Then I want then this is another um, important factor or component in Nakpil's music, is that he was the very first. Th there could have been others, but the, there could have been other composers, like as Leonardo Silos, you have um, uh, Jose Silos, you have uh, Natalio Mata, Manuel Mata, older composers as well as Ramon Valdez, but most of their works did not survive. With Julio Nakpil, during his old age, he rewrote most of his compositions. That's why, the reason why it survived. And I was very surprised when I found this in his, in his opus. This is the condiman. So, and I know from my study that the earliest condiman previous to the Honorato Lozano is the Joselina Baliwag, which was actually um, printed no? and presented by Professor Antonio Molina. And when I look at it, and it could have been that it's dated 1896 because it says that it's a condiman, no? Lehitimo condiman ng, ng uh, revolution. So it could have been 1896. It could not have been before that. But with, with Julio Nakpil, you see the condiman, and it's dated. He even um, uh, signed it. It was composed in 1892. Just after the 1887 um, exposition, wherein they, they transcribed the condiment, he used that melody but presented a whole organic work in his condiment. He wrote 
a specific introduction to it. He wrote uh, a coda to it. And you would see that it is in binary form. The first one is in minor, and then it will D minor, and then it goes to the relative major of F major. So you see that the form of the condiment is already because um, is already conceptualized in the music of Julio Nakpil. Uh, but quite interesting is that when you analyze the music of this condiment, you see that the melody is really a condiment. And written in the piece, it says, Lakad Tagalog. He knew that the condiment was a dance. It was a step. It, it was performed. But of course, this is a piano work. And I think this is the closest that we have to the description that Honorato Lozano was describing of the condiment. But one quite interesting fact is that his condiment is not in 3-4 time. It was in 4-4 four, four time. His condiment, because I, I, so I did research, are, are condiments really in 3-4 time? Yes, generally it's in 3-4 time. But I also found a condiment ng pag-ibig um, in, in a work, in, in a dissertation that was in 2-4 time. No? So we have to look at it. But when you listen to this, I will be playing uh, for you this whole piano work. But you would see really that fathom, that language. Now, I want you to look into the date that it was composed. It was 1892. Remember, according to the writings of uh, Jose Rizal, it, this was the favorite of Jose Rizal. The condiment was the favorite. And he even wrote, no, ang condiment ni Rizal. And he also wrote the canto de Maria Clara, Possibly the melody was from a condiment, but no music of that survived. No music of that survived. So it is possible that this is the closest that we have, that the condiment that was circulating during the time of Jose Rizal. 1892 was the year when Jose Rizal came to the Philippines, came back you know, from Spain to the Philippines, uh, from Hong Kong to the, to the, to the Philippines. And after a few days that he came back, he was actually deported or exiled to the Pitan. So it was during this time that, that this condiment was composed. And in 1893, you will see that Julio Nakpil will write another song, which is a romanza called Amor Patrio, that has very close similarity to the condiment, to the text of Jose Rizal's Canto de Maria Clara. So I want you to listen to this because this is the music that Rizal no, had in mind. It was the favorite of Rizal during the time, the condiment of Rizal's era composed by, um, composed by Julio Nakpil, but from the motives of the condiment. Or, okay, so let's see. Okay, so what you just heard is really that sentimentality, that, that emotionality that is present in the condiment. It's, it's a condiment except for its meter that it's uh, three, four times. So it's, it's um, the first part uh, it states that it's a lakad Tagalog no? in the movement of the Tagalog, which could refer to the song dance genre in slow moving movements. It is clear that Nakpil knows the condiment as it circulated orally no, among the Tagalog people. The first part was in D major. Uh, it, the, the piece is in D minor. No, the second section is in B flat. Um, 
major. Uh, so if if you would if you would look at it, if, uh, it's not in. Uh, if you would look at the the this condiment is that even though it's D minor, he starts it with a D major chord and ends it with a D major chord as well, which is the Picardy the third. So he was playing with all these um, nuances in the, in the harmonic idiom. And, and that is one very uh, important characteristic of Julio Nakpil. No? He didn't use just the regular, um, uh, m m regular modulations or harmonic progressions that is very common um, in the music of that time, but he was playing around, and, and it was this creativity that brought about and, and imbibing that sentimentality, that emotionality, with creativity in terms of his use of harmony, brought Philippine music to a new level, you know, to a new uh, level. Now, before uh, actually I end, I would have um, two more. Uh, by the way, the other piece is a lulai. So he did two genres. Eh. Uh, he, it's very interesting his lulai, but um, because of the, the time. So you just wait for the release of the Julio Nakpil uh, project, wherein you will be hearing all, most of this music. Now, in 1897, as we know, 1896, his hero, you know, he was, uh, his hero was Dr. Jose Rizal. He was a member of... Um, Results La Liga Filipina, and later on Julio Nakpil no, entered uh, the the cause of the revolution and entered the Katipunan under Andres Bonifacio, and many of his music uh, were composed as well during this time. But quite interesting is that when he entered the Katipunan, he entered November one, eighteen ninety six, no, so after the out, uh, after the outbreak of the revolution, the discovery of the Kantipunan in August, uh, is that most of his compositions now will present Tagalog. Before, it would be La, La, La Brisa Nocturna, La Brisa Aurora, he would have Recuerdos de Capis, but once he entered, most of his composition would be here. One of his, one of his first you know, would be Pahimakas, meaning last farewell. Parang this is the ultimo adios for for, who, uh, for his hero, Jose Rizal, who was executed December 30, 1896. And he would compose this the first quarter of 1897. And it would be printed. As you would see, uh, um, he dedicates this to uh, the most wise, no? uh, Jose Rizal. It says, Pahimakas, last farewell, sonitus planctus. It is a Latin word that means sound of mourning. So he was mourning, really, the death. And, and on the side of the manuscript of this piece, you, you see Deus Omnipotence. No? Deus, um, uh, uh, Lord have mercy. Uh, what's happening? So he was very disillusioned. So this one is a marcha funebre. So another important um, Western form, but presenting no, Filipino expressions, sentimentality, feelings, and, and even expressions of despair, resentment. No? So I want, uh, we, this, uh, this survived in two, uh, actually three versions. You have, um, so it could have been a very important piece for Julio Nakpil. He has the piano version. Actually, uh, this uh, uh, piano version has been printed. No, by Carmelo Ibauerman. And then the second one is a band, and the third is an orchestra score. So I would be playing with you the version of the symphonic band. Hey, um, okay, Rizal, uh, Rizal, I mean Julio Nakpil, this is in, uh, in D minor, but he starts it with a C sharp major chord, which is an exact talaga, it was a dissent, it was no, um, a refusal of the acceptance of what was happening. No, it, uh, he was resisting no, colonial rule, colonial power with that particular C-sharp major chord in a D minor uh, key. So let's listen to Pahimakas.
I mean, he was looking into the memory. Sige pa, in a go in a memory of that long. So the beautiful melodies. Then he brings in this. Maybe the marching towards the the Bagumbayan when Rizal is about to be executed. <coughs> and then he brings is the condiman melody because according to him, this is the favorite of Rizal. He ends the condiment and then brings back the death. Ends in the quietude of death. So this is an intensely patrioto, uh, patriotic piece, no? written by Rizal as to cope with that experience of the death of his, uh, of his hero. So Nakpil used the same condiman melody that he composed as a musical quotation in his piano work, Pahimakas, composed a few, um, a few months no, after the execution of Rizal to whom he dedicated the piece. The composition was published by Lithografia de Carmelo y Bauerman in Manila with Rizal's iconic image printed on the cover and the word Sonitus Planctus, the sound of mourning. The piece was later published on the second anniversary of Rizal's execution in 1898. Nakpil wrote in the printed score at the end, Ultimo Adios, Last Farewell. One can surmise Nakpil's political statement that resonated with other similar representations in public. The piece in D minor commences with a major subtonic chord, C sharp major. At the end of the piece, Nakpil brings in the eight measure condiment, followed by a dissolution that ends in the quietude of death. And later, of course, there would be more Filipinos who would be composing. And this is the condiment that I was telling you. This is a cover of that condiment. That condiment uh, of Hoseli Baliwag actually is a four uh, set piece, wherein you have the Pepita, Danza Tagalog, Liwayway, which is a danza Filipina, Joselina Baliwag, which is a condiman, and the end, Al Anillo de la Dalaga de Marmol, which is a tanda de valse, or the suite of valses. And just last night, when I was doing my presentation, a very uh, good friend and colleague in the Research Center for Culture, Arts, and Humanities, Dr. Jorge Mojaro, who's a Spanish scholar, uh, in, the in the university, gave me this piece, and it's called Halika by Juan Hernandez in 1911. And I was so surprised because it is a danza Filipina. So this is the very first time I've seen this piece that, that was uh, given to me through email by Dr. Jorge Mojaro just last night. So before I end, I, uh, since most of our audience, um, the most of uh, people who are listening are students and uh, teachers as well, I would like to present some recommendations. Now based on this, you know, what can we take from, from this talk? So number one, promote and support um, music knowledge production. No, we need um, much has yet to be done. Very little actually has been, has been done. Encourage musicians to go into musicology, no? the scholarly study of music, and contribute in the study of our music. If history needs historians, then we need musicologists to write about our music. We need to do extensive research on heritage music. And quite um, uh, unique actually in research, for example, when you go into history, when you go into literature, is that once you write it, it's done. But for us musicologists, we just don't write it. 
We have to produce it. We have to hear the sounds of, of, of that time. And then second is that accessibility of the produced knowledge to the stakeholders, teachers, students, and enthusiasts. We did research, but if this will not be disseminated to them, then we would continue to propagate you know, um, possibly wrong, wrong um, information or wrong knowledge of our music. So this digital age facilitates dissemination, that, but this would need support from government and private institutions because for now, it is mostly the, the, uh, the work no, of individual um, researchers. We need to come together to come up with a possible no, uh, digital sound and music archives that will be a repository of music materials, recordings, and production so that it would be readily available to um, us, especially for education purposes. Number three, there is a need not, not uh, there is a need to not decontextualize music teaching. The imposition of a prescribed cultural tradition is, in a way, a cultural intervention in itself. There is therefore a need for the drafting of a decolonized music education curriculum or a culture-based music education curriculum. And I look into, like for example, the Bohol. Now, Bohol province has actually come together. The church, um, you have the education sector, uh, you have the government sector coming together to actually um, rediscover their musical heritage. And then this is presented to the, to, to the students, to the children, to be performed. So we cannot impose, like how would we, in the same way, for example, in Bohol, cannot impose the teaching of uh, the gong music because it's not their tradition. But they can learn it after they are actually grounded in their tradition of their music. In the same way that I cannot impose this teaching. I'm a Tagalog, I don't have any province. And, and what brought me into this research? Because I want to make sense of my experience. No? Who, was, who grew up in the Tagalog region? No, I'm Tagalog, I don't have any affiliation of any province except Batangas, who is also, uh, who is, uh, uh, also uh, the, in the Katagalugan region. So it really brought me into my experience. This is the music that I was hearing when I was growing up. No? The Kondiman, the Nasaan Kairog, we would be singing this. No? Uh, so I wanted to make sense of my musical experience while growing up. So culture plays a great impact in music cognition. That is dependent on their preference, emotion, recognition, and musical memory. Individuals' music learning abilities are greater for culturally familiar music than for culturally unfamiliar music. Heritage is tied up with a place. This is a very big no, um, issue now in music education that would need actually to be addressed. And number four, emphasis should be given to music learning experiences grounded on their heritage that encourages creativity. It is once they are safe in their knowledge of roots of their heritage that we can stretch out to build new experiences of sound. And with this, I end this talk, but I want, no, the question is that, now why is this now all important in trying to look back into our heritage? Because this is what made us, and, and our understanding of our forms, our musical culture, would lead us to a deeper appreciation you know, of who we are as a people, that we take pride you know, of, of the richness of our musical heritage. There is unity in diversity. We, we, we need to explore and really engage into the rediscovery of our music tradition. And also is that creativity. Um, with this study, uh, I presented this to a singing group, um, a cappella go, the award-winning a cappella group, to try to look into how the music of Julio Nakpil can be heard again no, in, in, in this present day and age. That, uh, wherein we can make it more relevant and meaningful to the present generation because the generation that Nakpil wrote this was the generation of Rizal. And then they did this, so I want to present to you as the, the ending of this. They did uh, actually, um, they did arrange Amor Patrio. This is Rizal's um, Canto de Maria Clara, uh, a text from Noli Metangere, wherein Julio Nakpil wrote music. So Amor Patrio, meaning love of country. The text is in Spanish, so I asked 
actually my mom <laughs> no, to to create uh, to transcribe and create uh, a Tagalog text for this and then the a cappella uh, wrote uh, uh, made an arrangement for this so I want you to listen to this by young it's now titled Bayang Mahal from Omar Patrio. It's an 1893 composition by Julio Nakpil, written for Jose Rizal, made more meaningful in our time and age. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Dr. Alexandra Chua. Salamat po sa very insightful, very illuminating sharing of information about our musical past and how it can translate for our future. Ngayon po, tayo naman ay tutungo naman sa ating question and answer portion. Uh, meron po tayong mga magtatanong sa ating po mga Zoom participants. Uh, una po nating tawagin ay si Michael Fabian. Michael, anong iyong tanong kay Dr. Chua? Oh, um, yes. Ayun. Uh, Kiriale de Baclayon po ba is the oldest uh, extant na na choir book or if it's uh, if it is, bakit po hindi siya from the Colegio de Niños de Tiples de la Santa Iglesia Cathedral. Tapos second po is regarding Kumintang. So we uh, it is given po na Kumintang was originally a war song. Um meron lang pong question on how how did the subject of Kumintang turn into a love song from from uh, its previous subject of being a war song? And yung third po is, is there a significant difference between uh, Spanish and Filipino Zarzuela? Oh, okay, thank you so much, um, Michael, for that question. So three, the first, the, the Kirial. Why is it that um, it's not from the Colegios, the Ninos, the Tiples that we have the oldest extant? Basically, it did not survive. Apparently, um, if you would know that Manila, Manila was put into ground zero that so many losses of our um, musical and cultural heritage actually um, got lost from that. And, and the difficulty in retrieving that uh, basically uh, is the reason why we don't have much of our music. That's why in music now, we go to the peripheries, we go to the regions. Like for example, the, the, the Kirial is 1826, but it could have been um, re, um, so much related with the music of Manila then. Because uh, Diego, um, uh, Diego de la, uh, um, de la, um, the organ builder, uh, Diego de la Serra was actually from Manila, but he was uh, uh, the vicar of Baclayon. That's why in Baclayon there are many organs. But the only thing that survived in Intramuros during that time was actually San, Sebast uh, San Agustin Church, wherein you have that organ. But much of the music, I have, I, I did a research as well of the choir books of San Agustin, but it's difficult to date it. So, as of now, the earliest that we have the study, it's not the earliest um, notated because as what you've seen, the letra in Tagalo is from the 18th century. But we have very little uh, materials, music materials that survive. So, we need to go to the provinces or even to Spain to try to look into what survived in, in our uh, music. And the, the second is that about the war song, uh, the Kumintang as a war song. Again, we will never know. Why? Because evidence is not there. So the only thing for now that we have is the mala for the Kumintang and that Honorato Lozano, which is 1847. Remember that as, as our study, is the basis is really evidence. No, and without any evidence, we will never know at all. And, and I want to point out the, the importance you know, of keeping, keeping our musical heritage. Because once it's lost, it's lost and it will be very difficult and possibly you know, it would be lost forever and that it will never be retrieved at all and it will be forgotten in our history. So with being a war song, it's because, yeah, Comintang de la Conquista, possibly, no, or song, but even if you look into the words, no, there is already the tinge of a love song. Not, not just a song, but a dance, no, song genre no, for the Comintang. It's good that we had, we were able to retrieve um, some of this in, in, uh, from the 19th century, that we 
have now a, a more understanding, but definitely this is not uh, conclusive because remember uh, the study of evidence, uh, the study of history, the study of music would always be, be dependent on the evidence that we have. And, and the third, uh, sorry, I forgot your third question. Uh, is there a significance, uh, significant difference between uh, the, uh, the Spanish and the Filipino Sarsuela? Yes, of course. Actually, for one, it's very, very different. As I've told you, um, in trying to adopt, in trying to adopt or, or uh, get, it's not just a question of mimicry. It's not just a question of imitating it there would always be something of that person that will go into it. And as I've, told, uh, as I've um, shared with you, with a very limited... Now, one also problem is the sarsuela. No? Uh, we really don't know anything about the sarsuelas of the 19th century because we don't have extant music for it. That's why I was... It was a eureka moment for me when I found, when I found that Viaje Redondo um, Habanera because even our 20th century, early 20th century Sarasuela, our Sarasuela, the seditious place, no? the libretto is extant, but we don't have the music. We don't have much of the music. It's a good thing that we have uh, Walang Sugat, no? which is uh, the most commonly performed Sarasuela, but most of the Sarasuelas, I remember a friend, no? um, Carmen, uh, during the time of studying the sarsuela, and that was one problem, is that we don't have the music. And I attended one conference of the sarsuela uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Doreen Fernandez during that time, and, he and she was saying, yes, that's our big problem. We have the text, but we don't have the, the music. It is very possible that some of the music of this could have thrived in oral traditions. Um, because Sarsuelas is not only limited in the Tagalog region, there is also in the Visayas, in um, Ilocos. No? So music becomes a defining factor for this. And without writing down the music, without a written account of it, no, there is always this possibility that it will be lost. So there is definitely a big difference. You see, sabing and la sarsuela that has been transculturated to sarsuela, which is sarsuela with the Tagalog, no? A S A R S W E L A. So um, it would be very different when you look into. I was in Spain and I was um, watching. No, the Baroque sarsuelas of Spain, oh, it's so different. No? Even the 19th century sarsuela is very different. Because um, in, in trying to come up, we have this, the, the once-ness and the futurity. No? So what was old and what came out as new, it is already new because there is something new that came out of it based on the creator, the agent who made, who made it. So it becomes really Filipino. And remember that the Sarsuela was pronounced as the UNESCO, parang World Heritage of the Filipinos. But para, um, paradoxically, we, we, we don't have much study no, written on the Sarsuela, except for the literature. So for you, um, um, music uh, students and future music scholars, hopefully you can go and dig deeper into, into, our, into the tradition, into our musical tradition study. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Chua. Uh, we have our next uh, participant who will ask a question, uh, but because of due to time constraints, uh, please limit it to one question. <laughs> I know you're very excited, but maybe you can uh, contact Dr. Chua uh, directly for uh, if you have uh, so many questions about uh, their interesting topic for today. Uh, so I would like to call on Mr. Rafi Ronquillo. Rafi? Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I want to thank Ma'am Chua for her very informative talk today and I was also a student of Ma'am in the forms and analysis when I, I was studying in UST. So if, uh, if you would remember our reference book, Style and Structure by Leon Stein divided music into three categories. Um, art, obviously for artistic or purposes or artistic intentions, folk as being accepted by the community and functional for um, 
had specific functions for specific events or functions in the community. So um, referring to your topic today, uh, transcultural Filipino genres and the, the music you discussed, um, given your topic and the trend of musical composition at the time, is there a clear line or a line that divides this music or these music into the three categories or how, how does one find this line for for research purposes as well? Thank you, Rafi, for that very difficult question. Is that really categories? Now, there would always be a problem when you try to look into categorizing things, especially when you are looking into cultures such um, colonial cultures because of the mixing and hybridity makes it very difficult to categorize things. There would always be something in between to it. And musicologists had tended not to, for one, try to classify things. But it would be very difficult, and you can only do this once you have the full um, view you know, of things. But for me, like, if, if you look into what is folk, what is folk is that what practically has thrived into oral tradition. And basically, this kundiman, as you would see, this kuminta, the dance habanera was never folk. No, It was already a written tradition. It was already an offshoot already of the 19th century. But possibly, with that, you can look into no, the, the genre. But there is a book by Matthew, by Gilbert, into the inventions no, of traditions, into what is folk and what is written, and the, the not very clear divide no, between this, these two. That's why what I presented now is that the, the problem with being folk is that it, be, thriving on oral tradition makes it very, there would, the, one, one main question in this presentation is that what happens now to the folk? What happens to the oral? Why is it only the written? that is being presented. Practically, I wanted, because I wanted to focus on the written evidence, but definitely there is a need to study folk music. Now, there is a need to study, to, to actually gather and collect materials. Folk, uh, we, ha we are in the age of the uh, video already. The cell phone can take a video. Try to video it. Try to um, document this, because these are also important. Uh, actually, the Vilian Sikos that I studied in Bohol actually thrive already in folk, which is very interesting. Vilian Sikos being a written tradition from Spain, when it went to the Philippines, practically became folk. No? And then it became our Christmas songs. Then eventually went again to the written tradition. So there would always be a clear, the not, not very clear divide when you try to categorize things um, this way. But when you study it based on the culture or how it is, then something, a new knowledge you know, comes in. So maybe we should not <laughs> at all categorize it. Now, this is Hispanic, this is folk, this is, no, it's not. No? The Hispanic, as what we've seen, became Filipino already to us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chua. Thank you, Rafi, for the question. And now for our last participant, we'll ask uh, Edward Santelices. Edward? Hello. Uh, good afternoon. I think it's afternoon already. Yep. Good afternoon. Um, I just actually have one question. Uh, the, the talk of Mom Sandy actually elucidated um, many things and definitions that most of us doesn't know about forms. Um, in, in the Philippines, of musical forms in the Philippines. Um, as, a, as an educator, um, my only question is about uh, the practicality. Is it still practical to have these definitions be corrected uh, in textbooks, the, the textbook definition uh, of these forms in basic education, most especially? Um, and, um, or should it be left to the, to the, to the students in their own um, research initiatives? Uh, to actually discover the, the definitions of these forms. Thank you so much, um, Edward, for that question. Yes, it is very imperative that we study you know, our music. Let scholars study their music, uh, our music, so that we know that what would be propagated, what would be disseminated, has been thoroughly studied. Now, I'm not saying teachers, as I was telling one of my class, teachers' primary function is to teach. It's not their primary function to research 
no, about their music. But I'm not saying teachers cannot. Teachers definitely can. And if I uh, like most of you who are taking uh, further studies in the study of music would definitely can actually uh, uh, go into the research of, of music and uh, contribute to the production of, of knowledge. And you in itself are being musicologists in that way. But for example, teachers who does not any have any knowledge of music and what they only have access to is the internet, is that we will be propagating things that has been written by any person without really the knowledge of our particular music culture. And that is the danger. That's why I would want to look into really research-based you know, study of music in the Philippines and that this importance of disseminating it. So how can we disseminate this to teachers? I remember sitting in one of the DepEd um, uh, meetings during that time, wherein we have to review textbooks for music. And my question is that most of the textbooks were written not by experts in music. So there are quite a lot of mistakes into it. And number two is that it's all written. And I was saying, where is the recordings of this? It's not readily available. So there is really a need to rethink how we can disseminate you know, music, uh, from that has been studied actually by experts on Philippine music, just like musicians who have studied their music cultures in their particular region. And I would want to focus also that it's cultural. You cannot impose no, something that is not part of your culture, but you can actually study them if it is readily um, available. So there is really the need for support for a national thing, a, a big program to be able to have you know, to have um, uh, valid and um, um, sources on, on Philippine music. Because always, almost always, when I was teaching, teachers would tell me, Mom, I don't have the recording of this. Do you have a recording of this? Mom, po ang pyesa nito? Mom, where can we get it? Where can we get a sarsuela that we want to present? For example, it's none. None. We don't have it. We don't, even just recordings, um, you are being asked to discuss this particular music, where, where will I get it? In the internet. But who did that? So it's really a big um, a problem. Um, uh, the, we need the support of the different agencies really to, to look into how we can generate no, the knowledge society, particularly in, in the production of knowledge in our music, in our, in our culture, particularly music. So thank you, thank you so much, Edward, for that question. Thank you, ma'am. For all our participants, thank you, Dr. Chua. Um, so I guess that's it for this very, very exciting, no? very illuminating uh, a lecture for today. And um, so uh, we'd like to invite you again next for the uh, next topic, uh, for the next time. We have singing Philippine folk songs with bamboo instruments. Uh, with the speaker, Professor Dolores Andres. So tune in again next time and thank you very much.